does workout videos in their underpants. <laughs> Welcome to another edition of the Around the NFL podcast. That's true. I'll let you guess who it is. My name is Dan Hansis, coming to you from a virtual room filled with some heroes. Greg Rosenthal, and yes, that man, Mark Sessler. What's up, boys? What a day. We, you know, we came on and, and Mark gave me the kind of like, whoa, we had some games today, you know, not even on the show. So that that's when you know it's a good day. Games. Yeah, what? It, it felt like an epically long day, and I don't mean that in a negative way. Just there was just um, a flock of games These that games went are never right over. into the very end. Right. And last night was Halloween, <laughs> and um, we, in our house, we tried very hard to give the boys a nice Halloween and we have a, you know, I think a lot of people have this. They have a, a little cluster of people that are in the trust circle, the COVID trust circle. And, and mm-hmm. we have uh, two other families with kids. So they all came over the house and, um, you know, daddy's going to get a little loose in that situation. It's been a long <laughs> year. So when daddy gets loose uh, and then you have an NFL Sunday, I'll put it this way. When we started this podcast in 2013, the bounce back was easier than it is in 2020. After marriage, age progression, COVID-19 pandemic, two children. But I'm a warrior. Hmm. You are right. But I, I I normally don't like to bring this up, but I'm about six and a half, seven years older than the two of you. And so, um, you know. I would just offer that it's seven seven years um, less fun to recover from things like that, or just even staying up late. You know, oh, wow. um, we're here though, and we're alive, and that's a beautiful thing. Um, and why is it always the same teams that the heartbreak happens to? Why does we're gonna get to it? We're gonna get to all the games in week eight as we reach the midway ish point of another regular season. Uh, we'll go through every game, but let's start with the premier AFC matchup of the afternoon. And here's the snap, he's back. Steps up, fires for the goal line, and the pass is broken up at the goal line. And that is terrific job by the Steelers secondary to close in on Willie Sneed the fourth. The ball game is over. Bill Hillgrove and Tunch Ilkin with the call WDVE. Lamar Jackson, man, he has not had the magic this year. The reigning MVP's final pass as time expired fell incomplete. And the Pittsburgh Steelers escaped Baltimore with a 28-24 win. The Steelers moved to 7-0 and now hold a commanding lead in the AFC North. Greg, the Steelers' defense was too much for Lamar. And- they were. They're a defense that has so many great players that on a day where they got steamrolled a little bit on the ground, the, you know, the Ravens put up 265 yards on the ground uh, you know, almost 180 in the first half that they have enough good players that they can make enough game changing plays to escape a victory in a game that they really shouldn't. And and I hate starting with Lamar because he did make a number of um, spectacular plays in this game too. So there, there were positives and the Ravens offense at times looked better than it did all year, but you can't get past the fact that his first throw of the game was a pick six his first throw of the second half, I believe it was the first throw, uh, was intercepted. And that was at a time of the game where the Ravens were absolutely dominant. And then he gets the ball twice in the last uh, five minutes. And the Steelers defense does a great job stopping him on fourth down uh, inside the 10-yard line. You think that's going to be it. They force a three and out. And then we listened you know, to the final sequence where the, the Ravens almost pulled it out again, getting into winning position. And you're right. They've just been a, a player too short on a day where they had a lot of positives if they had just made one more play. This is a devastating loss, not just to fall two games back, but to lose Ronnie Stanley, their left tackle, mm. for the season. That is a Very one-two tall. punch that I- I'm sure people in Baltimore are, are pretty depressed about right now. I mean, if you this Ravens team, we've been waiting for them to appear as they did last year, and they just haven't. If you told me that on the flip side that the Steelers would have 48 yards on the ground, and no one um, other than Juju Smith-Schuster crossing 50 yards through the air, I would look at that ahead of time and think that Baltimore took care of business. Um, 
the Steelers just find a way. And I, right. I, I don't, you know, I don't think this is a surprising result. Um, it was my lock of the week. So, you know, yeah. I went in thinking it could happen. Um, but suddenly you just start to look at the Ravens differently. And, and when we came into this season, it was so like crystallized to everyone watching football that the Chiefs and the Ravens were that upper echelon. And we didn't really know what the Steelers were going to be. And I, I, I would flip those two teams now. Mm. The Steelers are right up there. I mean, it's, it's funny because I remember in the summer, people that follow the league very closely, people that travel on the road and, and did a lot of the camp previews, you felt like there was a lot of the sentiment out there. Watch out for the Ravens. They're even better this year, which always struck me as a little bit odd because it's so hard to do what they did last year, which was just be so historically dominant. And that's what made that disappointment in January uh, all the more difficult to handle because that was such a special year. When you have those special years, you want to be able to take advantage of it. So there's just some you know pains this year, obviously, that weren't in the picture uh last year and you know they ran for 265 yards in this game right i mean that is that's a huge number they did that all the time against the steelers against the steelers and and to not do it and yeah you don't want to put everything on lamar but listen when you're the defending mvp much is expected of you if he plays better they win this game and the afc north is a lot different right now so I don't want to put all the focus on Lamar, but his play and his relative struggles this season are a big story around Baltimore. Yeah, and it's relative. I still think he's played like a top, you know, twelve QB this year, and including in this game. I mean, that. I, but that's I don't, a big disappointment, Greg. No, to, no, it's a big to step put him back. In that a- absolutely, and the passing game is is the bigger disappointment. Um, I, but I also wouldn't, you know, look at this as like, hey, they're done. I mean, they're five and two, and they just. They kind of dominated the Steelers uh, in this game. And you went into halftime with it being 17-7 thinking, oh, this is trouble for the Ravens because, Mm -hmm. I mean, they put one on them. I mean, they absolutely ran them up and down. The only seven points in the first half was that pick six. It was was looking like varsity and JV, to use a, a Tomlin expression. And it's not like even the Steelers' comeback felt like they were the ones dominating. The Steelers' offense is the one that looked rather limited. The Ravens' defense has played really well all year, and they played well today. Um, but the Ravens aren't making plays in the big moments, uh, at least in this game. They haven't had a lot of close games. It's been a strange season. They also have a, you know some people getting upset. Hollywood Brown, I don't know if you yeah. saw his tweet yeah. that was deleted. He said, what's the point of having soldiers when you never use them? Parentheses, never double exclamation point. Yeah. <laughs> the double slammer is what got me. And, of course, soldiers, S-O-U-L-J-A-S. Um, actually, since you brought it up, Greg, hey, Ricky, I want to check – Hollywood Brown's social media accounts to see if he is untagged all Ravens content. I'm moving to Instagram. <laughs> oh no. Stop. All right. I have there it is. Twitter. No, he has not removed <laughs> Ravens related content from either of his feeds. So it appears at this time uh, he intends to stay with the Ravens mm. beyond the trade deadline. <laughs> this was a classic, though. Uh, thanks for the the Raven Steelers for delivering. I mean, Marquise yeah. Brown, he can be he can be upset. They'll 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 figure it out. But there was like there was five forced fumbles in this game. There were fourth down stops. There were pick sixes. Um, it was kind of everything. They were like huge hits. There was Ben Roethlisberger saying after the game, the one part of the game where their offense looked good, they were kind of in that muddle huddle where it's like they're not really huddling and they're going five wide and they're just playing hurry up. And he says he was just calling plays, like making up the plays in the huddle. Like that was the only part of the game that worked. It, it was it was fun. That's what I do feel about the Steelers. Though. They seem to be just in this wonderful groove. Uh, and, you know, they're very dangerous when they get that way. Uh, I I trust this team as much as I trust any team in the AFC, and I don't think that people have like figured out the Ravens. But to your point, Dan, asking for them to be tangibly more dangerous than they were when they were 14 and two, and people were watching Lamar Jackson every week with literally no antidote on how to stop him. Right. Well, there's a whole lot They've more tape them now. rushing. 15 yep. for 64 on the ground today was uh, that that says a lot. All right, let us move on. Snap looks good, holds down, kick is up, and it is through the uprights, and the New Orleans Saints are going to win one in overtime here in Chicago. That is the end of the game. (laughs) The official is a little bit of a glory boy there. We know. It's overtime. (laughs) 
where there were multiple possessions and the field goal ends the game. Unnecessary. What's the old word in, in journalism, you know, the saying, like, don't say something in 30 words when you could say it in seven. Sure. Well, brevity. Maybe the officials. And I'm going to get, I got some more issues with the officials later on. I'm talking about your brownies, that game, Mark. All right, let's talk about it. Will Lutz went straight down the middle from 35 yards out in overtime. The deciding points in the Saints 26-23 win over the Bears at empty Soldier Field. These empty stadiums. And I know there's people in some of them now. Oh, I just hate it. Never going to get used to it. The Bears wiped out a 10-point deficit in the second half. A minor miracle considering the level of play they're getting at quarterback right now. But the Saints got to stop an OT. Then that final drive in overtime to set up the game-winning field goal. Uh... I don't know, an ugly, sloppy, kind of strange game, I thought, uh, where it seemed at first the Bears got off to um, a nice start, and then they gave up for the fifth straight game. The Saints have a touchdown in the final minute of the first half, which is a crazy thing. And uh, hmm. I believe four of them have been inside 20 seconds or something insane. They gave up an uncontested Touchdown to Jared Cook um, to narrow the game. And then they got really sloppy in the third quarter, including one of the one of the worst um, acts, displays of uh, behavior on a field. Did you see this? This, this was unbelievable. To yes. Me. I, I am still trying to process it. Who is the wide receiver's name? Uh, what, Javon what? Wims was who got kicked out of the game. Yeah, he I guess the previous position, he, he stuck his. Um, a defender stuck his finger in, in Vim's face. And then on the on the following drive, he went to grab the guy's chain, Gardner Johnson's chain, missed that, and then just two roundhouse punches. Like, And Gardner Johnson was just like, what's happening? He never hit back or anything. So it was just like this. the game seemed to be spiraling and, and Foles couldn't move the offense. Uh, so I guess I give them credit, uh, the Bears, for getting off the mat because the game – uh, once it got to a 10-point deficit in the second half, it felt like it had gotten, it had gotten away with from them. Uh, but uh, they even the score, but they don't have any ability to um, close out this game because it's the same old thing. And there's one point where Troy Aikman, boys, said, uh, this is where you miss Mitch Trubisky. That's where we're at. <laughs> I saw a lot Nick of that Foles. on Twitter, too, where suddenly people were you know, suggesting that maybe Trubisky could be doing things mm. that – uh, Foles was not. I mean, I think if you're the Bears defense and the, and the whole season rides on the Bears defense, and, you know, this game was close, so but Alvin Kamara, I mean, and it's it's not a surprise or a stunner. I mean, he is a legit premier talent, probably the best back in the league, but he lit them up through the air, and I thought towards the end, I mean, he just gave them signs of life. There was that one huge play that sprung them, and my, my one question for you is, like, with uh, Sean Payton, it's tempting, you know, lining up to do the field goal with a minute 40 left. Um, he said that that was just his gut feeling. I don't have a big problem with that, but that was a lot of room and time left for the Bears potentially. Yeah, it was very dumb because I believe there was a minute 40. If they miss the kick, uh, you give the Bears a chance, obviously, to go down the field rather than, hey, it, it can accomplish two things as long as you're not terrified of fumbling the ball and having a turnover of some kind. You get closer for Lutz, and you effectively can only win or tie the game. So they, they went for it, got away with it. But that, that was just kind of the game in a nutshell. It was just a little bit sloppy by all parties. It was one of the dumbest decisions of the year. He should be killed for it. I mean, just because just because he hits That's the strong, kick. But... Like a Matt not killed. I mean, yeah. like literally. I mean, that would be a lot. But uh, like I, I do think about that. Like you sh we should almost come with the same energy, even if you hit the kick, when you make a ridiculous decision. Beca just because these coaches all talk about – doing everything possible to gain the slightest edge in like just like having a half a percent chance better chance to win the game and like working in the offseason doing all this stuff and you're like l literally like giving your team a chance to either tie or lose that game just by not kneeling plus it's stupid Lutz had missed the 27 yarder earlier that game like you have Kamara just run the ball three times I mean I, kneeling would have been fine there too and running the clock out then I wouldn't I wouldn't be saying uh, that he should you know be killed or anything but that but r run the ball I mean I I kind of felt like they deserved to, to blow that one at that point and and this was a game I'm sure uh, if Chris Wessling was on 
on this show, and I, I know he was watching somewhat, that uh, the, the Drew Brees arm strength um, truthers, which, of which he's one, uh, he, he's, not, he's not built for outdoors, you know, in the cold, uh, in the playoffs. I mean, that, it was rough many times in this game, and he, he got away with a couple. I agree with that. This was their first outdoor game of the season, in fact, and um, those, some of those throws, the outs, when he had to push the ball downfield, it just hung up an extra second, and that's all it takes in the NFL. He got away with a few throws, actually, that could have led to total chaos. So it is, with the Saints, they're 5-2 and two now. Like, realistically, and they're going to be hurt by the fact that the games aren't going to be played in, full, in front of um, a sold-out Fan base and I don't. Are they still trying to move out of the Superdome potentially to play home games? I don't <laughs> I know what's was, going on. That was drama that. continues on. That was a but threat. They, they wrap, I don't know if they're gonna do yeah. it. Yeah. But this team needs to have home games in the playoffs because I think we could see how it's gonna go if he has to go on the road. But Kamara, yeah, he's uh, he had almost uh, I think 160 yards from hmm. scrimmage and is just it's so free and easy with him. He's been their MVP this year. And the Bears' defense kept put, being put in tough spots, whether it was special teams or turnovers, where they're getting three and outs and Saints are kicking field goals. Saints could have won this you know, bigger, but they, they got to be happy they win a game without Emmanuel Sanders, Marquez Calloway, and Michael Thomas. I mean, that is your, it is your top three receivers. Um, and just quickly, a shout-out to Allen Robinson, who I feel like is maybe an all-pro and stuck mm. on that team. Like, he is, he is a top two or three receiver right now. And, like... I locked this game up, and when I did, I thought he was out for this game, and he almost was the difference. He kept yeah. them almost single-handedly in this game. That's that's funny you bring that up because I was going to say my Christmas wish, because he's heading toward free agency, uh, is Trevor Lawrence as the Jets quarterback with Allen Robinson and Denzel Mims there you go. on the outside and Jameson Crowder in the slot. That sounds pretty good to me because this dude, it doesn't matter what crap quarterback he plays with, he puts up big numbers. His touchdown catch is one of the highest degree of difficulty catches oh, uh, that a, you'll see. It's a beautiful grab. I, I like Daryl Mooney too. I think that he's, you know, he fits with Foles, but there was this one play towards the end where Foles, you know, needed to make a throw and he's escaping the pocket. And it just reminds you that Nick Foles, the kind of quarterback that Nick Foles is, probably just won't exist. Can't move. 12, 13, exactly. And it's like he just got he ransacked by an active New Orleans pass rush, and, you know, that's the game. And his mechanics are clunky, and he just he's just not the same guy he was a couple of years ago. All right, uh, let's move on. Locke rolls to his right. Locke throws a ball. In zone, catch. Touchdown, Denver. No, he – no, what are they saying? K.J. Hamler caught the ball. Now one official. Yes, touchdown. Touchdown, Denver. Holy mackerel. I mean, Dave Logan, good job, KOA. The officials again. K.J. Hamler, he makes that catch. He gets two butt cheeks down. What do you call an incomplete for? That's the catch. Drew Locke rolled it to his right, found K.J. Hamler who got his butt down as time expired, tying the game with the Chargers. Brandon McManus then hit the PAT, and Denver had locked up a thrilling, well, I shouldn't say locked up, because Ricky locked up the Chargers. A thrilling 31-30 win over the Chargers at mile high. Greg, the Broncos have been your pet project all year, and they kind of showed all sides of themselves in this one. They did. They lucked out. They they deserve, you know, to enjoy um, a win. They've had some tough losses. But my God, this I'm still recovering from watching this game. I'm just thinking of that. Just like, no, no. What are you what are you doing, Chargers? It was more about the Chargers <laughs> blowing it. I really feel that um, it, it was as dominant a, a game as I've seen. At one point, it was about 300-something yards to 50, 20-something first downs to two. Uh, the score is 24 to three. It's midway through the third quarter. The fans Even are booing. The, the 10,000 fans, fans are booing. They, you know when they booed the most, I think, was after a Drew Locke interception at the end of the third quarter. So Locke, who had been terrible through three quarters, to be clear, their one touchdown was off a 55-yard uh, you know, Lindsey uh, run. That's where, the, that's where it started, and so that's the Chargers' defense. And after that, Locke throws an interception. So it's not even like Locke played well uh, consistently until the fourth quarter where they go touchdown, uh, touchdown, touchdown. And 
one was a blown coverage. You know, Herbert has an interception where it's a jump ball and it ends up being a helmet catch interception. That's some Chargers stuff right there. Uh, but there's no rule that you have to give up this long drive at the end of the game to blow it either with a bunch of penalties. And it's just like, even the, the offense was moving it throughout. I'm like exasperated. Even though I, you know, I, the, the Broncos in theory were this team I was behind. They did not deserve to win this game. It, it's a, it's something special what the Chargers are doing. It's crazy. In three straight games where they've blown 16 point leads, the Chargers. And it's like, we talk about this Come every on. week because this is who they've been for under Anthony Lynn. And it's it's hard because they're fun and they're doubly fun with Justin Herbert. I, can, I viewed them as like one of these teams that forget the first two months of the season. If they get hot, they could maybe beat anyone. And yet they beat themselves. That's who they beat. Mm. Three straight games. It's four. It's actually points. four, although it's a little bit of a weird stat because one of those they won against the Jaguars. But it's four <laughs> straight games. And, and they also blew an 11-point uh, lead and a loss to the Chiefs, too. That doesn't even count that one. So it, it's outrageous. That's their nature. I mean, and it's been, yes, Anthony Lynn, it's been a part of his regime. But, like, this is Chargers football. This has been going on for years and years and years. They, they, just, they just find a way to do it. They, you know, they lost lead of 11 points to the Chiefs in Week 2. Right. 17 points to both the Bucks and the Saints in Weeks 4 and 5. They lost the 16-point lead to the Jaguars. They won that game. And now this. I mean, it just it can't happen. And they have to find out. I know they've been hit hard by injuries on the defensive side of the ball, especially. Better now. Better now. Um, but at the same time, there's just no excuse this cannot be happening. It is a reflection on some level of the coaching, for sure. It, ha- it yep. has to be. It's I The look on Anthony Lynn's face, you know, just to set up um, – that game tying touchdown and they kicked the extra point with no time left. The only reason that happened is because there was a penalty on the play before that the the Broncos ran from about the seven yard line. The Broncos mismanaged the two minute drill horribly too. They're like calling runs in the middle of this. And then they ran out of time and there's a penalty on that play. And Anthony Lynn comes running and kind of looking down, looking at the official going, no, no, no. And the look on his face was like, it was like a little child and telling oh. him that it, well, there wasn't Christmas happening this year. It felt like every Chargers fan. I don't, I and don't they, know. And they ran the ball for 200-plus yards. I mean, so right. they're doing what Anthony Lynn wants. And if you're running the ball that well, it's like 5.5 yards per carry, you should be able to close out a game with a huge lead. Right. The thing that's crazy is it's not like the offense collapsed. There was that helmet catch interception, which was a, you know, a little lucky, but a nice play by Bryce Callen. And then um, Herbert went field goal, field goal and took some mm-hmm. time off the clock. The only reason why the Chargers won is because these drives partly were so quick. They had a two play 60 yard drive that took 27 seconds with like a blown coverage in the secondary. The Chargers look so awesome. They're healthier on defense. They have Melvin Ingram back. They're different with Ingram. They have Justin Jones back. They they were dominant. And I'm thinking, wow, this Chargers team could be something. Uh, and then and this happens. Dan, I did ask for the, the money uh, in DJ call of the Hamler touch. I have not heard it yet. So we'll Ooh, let's we'll see if it's good. But let, let's hear it, Ricky. Well, here it is. This is the game. One second left. Get in. And it will be tied. Lock in the shotgun. Gordon in the backfield. Fakes the handoff, rolling to his right. Locke still looking, throws, caught. Incomplete. Incomplete. He was out of bounds. And now the referee's discussing it. Signal on the field is incomplete. Uh. Now they say touchdown. After a discussion, they say touchdown. (laughs) K.J. Hamler. Boy, the Chargers have found ways to lose games this season. But this is going to be the most painful of them all. (laughs) How yeah, many more ways can money, you know, have to describe right. these losses? This was it, though. This was another level. At least the other ones were against good teams, and they blew the leads earlier. This was next level, a division opponent, everything. Was I, I've gotten to know money uh, over the past couple of years doing the power ranking show with him, and he's like other guys that work in the broadcast booths for these teams. They're not homers, but also it's just a better gig when the team's winning right. uh, because you're around the team so much, and, you know, you're kind of part of the whole adventure. Uh, so, you know, money and DJ, they're going through that loss too. And the, and the wreckage mm. that comes from it, it is just a tough situation. We'll give the final word to linebacker Drew Tranquil, who didn't play in this game with an injury, but he tweeted insanity is doing the same thing over and over again and expecting different results. Stick mm. with us. We will turn the tide. Hmm. Chargers fans have been hearing that for about 50 years. Let's move on. 
Going to take the shotgun snap. Takes it. Going to keep it and run with it. Left side. Gets good yardage inside the 15. Ball. No ball comes out. Loose ball. Who's got it? The Bills may have it. It is Buffalo ball. Cam Newton fumbled at the 12-yard line, and the Bills recover. It game. looks like Marlowe on the bottom of the pile comes up with the football. That is the game Justin right Zimmer there. Justin Zimmer got the strip, I believe, and the Bills come up with the football with 31 seconds left. Oh, my goodness. John Murphy and Steve Tasker with the call for WGR. And, yes, Ricky, being the intrepid producer that she is, also did pull the Zolak call. But, again, Zolak is basically incapacitated now during Patriots games. He was silent uh, on that Cam Newton play. Squeeze it, Cam. The Patriots were driving for the go-ahead score in the final minutes against the Bills, but Buffalo separated Newton from the football and fell on the fumble to clinch a 24-21 win at Orchard Park. Buffalo snapped a seven-game losing streak to the Patriots, just barely locking it up for the old Zeus, by the way. Nice to meet you, the heroes. Mark, how are we feeling about the Bills after this one? They're kind of a, a tough team to peg right now. Yeah, I, I, I don't feel a whole lot better about them. Um, I think if, there was, if you want to shine a positive light on their offense, uh, their running game came to life with Zach Moss and Devin Singletary, Josh Allen. The three of them combined for other over 200 yards on the ground. Uh, weather was a little bit of a factor in this one, but I look at these two teams as sort of, uh, which I wouldn't have said this a month ago, is almost mirrors on offense, mm. um, save for the fact that New England lacks uh, wide receivers that anyone's heard of or who are reliable. Uh, I mean, you, you, you've got a little more star power in Buffalo, but Cam Newton and the Patriots fought so hard in this game. They came into it with one tight end, Ryan Izzo. One. They came, and this is a team that would probably like to use three if they had them half the time. And they, in the second half, it, it, they really imposed their well on, on Buffalo. It's their defense, Buffalo's defense, that has me a little more concerned. Uh, Demir Bird made a couple plays with Cam. Damian Harris was ripping through them. And I really thought that they were heading to win this game. And then the Cam fumble happened. And it's just like, it's an excruciating um, club to watch because there are no namers on offense, which makes me kind of enjoy them more or, or root for them more from an underdog mm. nature. But... Buffalo took care of business, but I come out of it, um, you know, I'm, sus I, I'm, a, I'm suspicious of Buffalo. I, I don't trust them to really uh, be the offense they were earlier in the year. They just look very different to me. Well, they're a classic team to me that's 6-2 and two and just has to be happy they're 6-2, and two, that they have the components to be better because we've seen it, to be the offense they were closer in September than October. If they play like this, you know, they're going to lose early in the playoffs if, if they make it. I mean, Sean McDermott had a quote after the game that said, you know, this win made him emotional, that he tries to go through it one day, one day at a time, process, process, but we know what this means to our franchise. We wish they could have, you know, and our fan base, like what the, we, we've we been building to this. You know, for myself, it's like a, a validation. It's an emotional win for the entire city. And it's like, okay, but you got, but they need to be a lot better better than they are right now because you're just going to be a, a first round loser in the playoffs. I think they can be like they have the pieces to be better on defense and offense than they've played, but it's been about a month now for the Bills. Yeah, they lost their starting center. I don't like that for them. Mitch Morse, I want to see what goes on with that, but uh, I don't know. I like it's in terms of a transformative victory. Uh, it was just sort of like they hung on and got out of here with a win. Well, as someone that's had a front row seat for the AFC East in the worst way for the last couple of decades. I think it is a very notable win um, in the fact that the Bills, according to what you're saying, Mark, did not play very well and still beat the Patriots. Things have, things have changed in this division, and it was something that people that despise the Patriots or were just sick of the Patriots waited for for years and years and years. Uh, but it has happened. It's a changing yeah. of the guard. And I don't know. The only thing that I don't know, and I think it's unclear, is like, is this now the Bills' division? where it's going to be their realm for a couple of years? Or do they have enough problems where, and I don't think we should be crowning anybody uh, in that division right now, but they have surpassed the Patriots as the as the better, better team in this division, and they have things to work out. But the fact that New England has basically now just faded from the picture on a four-game losing streak is notable. And I think that's what I take out of this game, that once again, when the Patriots lose, and they're now on an extended losing streak, and the head coach, the legendary head coach Bill Belichick, when he's 
at the Zoom podium. He's answering questions week after week about who his starting quarterback's going to be. Like, this is all stuff that just wasn't happening for decades. And right. I think it's just notable that's where we are now. Well, that's why I think if, you know, you're Belichick or Cam Newton, that's why that fumble is such a killer because this, this really was their chance. Needed they're it. In, they're in yep. field goal range. They have the Jets next week. In theory, there's a route to go 4-4. Four and four. There's a lot of tough games at the schedule. This team does not in any way – look like um a contender but if they win this game it's like well it's just the bills the dolphins and them and and someone's got to get in and so that's devastating they've had these moral victories like well if cam was healthy against kansas city what a defensive performance if cam you know gets one extra yard in seattle they get a win if this is another game where they had a position but it's not happening for them and there's not really a big reason to think talent wise they're going to recover gilmore was out for this game julian edelman's on injured reserve um, it's JC not like Jackson got hurt. Uh, it's you, not like there's people know. coming that's that's coming to save them. I think you the difference between Gilmore... the two teams is the front office right now. Frank, I mean, Buffalo, you know, their their front office and their coaching staff are in unison. And I know, you know, Belichick, I am career wise is, is up there with Ozzie Newsome. But you'd have to look at the way this team is constructed around Cam Newton and say, how is any quarterback going to come out of this season with five wins? Hmm. You wonder if Gilmore was sat as a precaution if they are planning to make a trade as well with the deadline coming up in a couple of days. Uh, and one last note, and we'll, you know, study the bills more um, in the weeks ahead, but Josh Allen, the first four games, he was a leader in the MVP race. He had a 71% completion percentage, averaging 330 yards per game through the air, 12 touchdowns, one pick, passer rating of 123. The last four games, the completion percentage is down almost 10 points. He's down to 211.5 yards per game, four touchdowns in four games passing, and a passer rating of sub-80. So he has kind of regressed in the last four weeks back to this being this enigmatic guy that nobody really knows um, what to make of him. So that is, to me, one of the big storylines in the second half of the season in the AFC is like, how does Josh Allen close this season? Where are we going to finish up? How are we going to see him uh, when the dust settles? Let's move on. Carr takes a snap, looks in that direction, fires to Renfro. Renfro's got it in the end zone. Renfro with a touchdown that puts the Raiders ahead here in the fourth quarter. Playing in miserable weather conditions. That was Brent Musburger, of course. Do I even have to say KRLV? Uh, playing in miserable weather conditions, Derek Carr threw just one touchdown pass. Well, won the count it anyway. But it was enough in a 16 6 win over the Browns. In Cleveland, rain, sleet, howling wind, uh, whipping around at 35 miles per hour. No Oof. joke. Um, and obviously that's going to inform the pace of play. Uh, the Browns had five drops in this game. The weather played a role, I'm sure, with that. Not to make any, any excuses. Um, and the Raiders used... They were just more physical than the Browns in this game. This was like a... It should have been playing to the Browns' favor. They're the they're at home. They're the the rugged AFC North team. Uh, but it was the Raiders who ran the ball with authority, um, including Josh Jacobs, who had 128 yards and 31 carries. That's the most rushes for Raiders running back since 2007. And they just, they just hit harder. The play of the game was slot cornerback Lamarcus Joyner, who laid a clean. Punishing hit right into the back of Jarvis Landry. He was already playing with bad ribs uh, to save a touchdown in the final minutes and essentially take the drama out of the game after a missed field goal shortly thereafter. Um, So uh, good on the Raiders for another nice road win. And I was texting with Mark, um, and we're both on the same page here, that the the Browns are just okay, it seems. Like they're they're capable of having good weeks, like we saw last week, and they're capable of having weeks like this. Uh, So you don't really know what you're going to get week to week, and this was a bad week. Yeah, I mean, I I was watching this on the side, and I I think this is a Cleveland team that you can kind of tell pretty early into the game whether they're not they're in their flow because when they have been, they've been pretty dynamic on offense. Um, This was I, I can't remember too many Browns games where Mother Nature uh, wreaked as much havoc, to your point. I, I, and it was like, look, it, you, you don't have a, a, a leading receiver for Las Vegas with more than 28 yards. Cleveland wasn't far from that themselves. There were hideous drops. David Njoku had one of the 
I mean, you know, this is trade it's bait bad. and you're not helping yourself get traded or helping yourself acclimate to a new coaching staff in Cleveland with some of his play. Um, I think they really miss Wyatt Teller. I think they really miss Nick Chubb, who would have been, this would have been a perfect Nick right. Chubb kind of game. And I like, Kareem Hunt is a, a, a wonderful back, but Nick Chubb brings something a little bit different than Kareem Hunt. And, uh, you know, you're missing Austin Hooper. Miles Garrett was out for part of this, but no excuses because both teams were dealing with totally chaotic weather and the Raiders were tougher. Right. They The Raiders found out Sunday that Trent Brown couldn't play their right, their great right tackle because of a, a mistake in, uh, what was it, an injection, a Tyrod this Taylor was type crazy. Situ- situation. Not, and he had to go to the hospital. He's he got air there. in his IV, right. which is huh. a very dangerous situation. So I, I think, and this is, I guess, even more true because Brown wasn't there, that it, it has to be disappointing for the Browns because of what Dan said. That kind of like their identity is their offensive line and um, kind of being a tough hard-nosed uh, running team and the Raiders were better at that and that's that's to me that's the Raiders identity too I don't think people think about them that way it's how I think about them and it was a, a game where it's 71 to 47 uh, in terms of plays so the Raiders kind of controlled that and I give the Raiders a lot of credit uh, at four and three because they have had the hardest schedule in the NFL um, um, according to their opponents like winning percentage and they're four and three mm. they, they really are a good four and three team and you know they Obviously, they didn't play very well last week against the Bucks, but everybody that catches the Bucks right now is catching hell. But they've sandwiched that loss with the win in Arrowhead and then this nice win in a tough situation in Cleveland. Um, so good on them. And bad job by the refs. That was – this game had three touchdowns that were um, led to reviews, and two of the three were over, overturned. Henry Ruggs had a touchdown catch where they had a freeze frame on the telecast – showing probably about two inches, you see blades of grass between the end zone, green, and then the white out-of-bounds boundary. And they kept the call on the field, ruling it that it was Hmm. not a touchdown. Like, that cannot – it cannot happen with the technology that we have in the league, what's at stake on a week-to-week basis in our league. I I just was blown away that that call – uh, didn't result in a touchdown. Absolutely, and I didn't love the Landry one either. I, I can. There's a reason you can make a case for the Landry one not being a catch, and, and that's right. fine. But that's but, that's different because they didn't have the angle on it. You could see the ball starting to move, but there was no Zapruder film angle to say, okay, it definitely was incomplete. The Rugs one was. I don't know what. There's somebody's got to answer questions in the New York office yeah, after that. I that don't know what's, what else to be said. Uh, Miles Garrett was limited in this game. He was. Help, he was basically a specialist, a, a pass rushing specialist, and he's getting an MRI on his knee. So that is the mm. last thing you want to hear uh, because he's obviously the heart and soul of that Browns defense. And, uh, yeah, the Kareem Hunt thing, that was my last thought on the game. When Chubb was there and Hunt was there, that was becoming one of the big stories in the NFL. Like, they have an identity. They have a two-headed monster. And then even when Chubb got hurt, it's like you still have a, a former rushing champion in Hunt. Hasn't quite played out the way – I think a lot of people expect it. And I know there are some challenges with the offensive line injuries and and Baker and, and the Odell injury, but he, Hunt has not really taken the ball and run with it uh, yeah. to use. I mean, he's attempted term. to run with it, to take the ball and run with it. It's not always uh, work to perfection. Yes. All right. Let's move on. Throws back inside. Ball is caught. It's Metcalf who makes one man now. Two men miss. 30, 25, 20. Turns up field. They don't touch him. Touchdown, Seahawks. How in the world did he tiptoe up the sidelines? Two defenders breaking on him and nobody touched him. Oh, yeah. DK deserves the Kong music this week. <laughs> oh, man. DK Metcalf set career highs with 12 catches, 161 yards, two Oof. touchdowns, including that unbelievable touchdown uh, at the end of the first quarter that only a few guys in the league can do when you can turn the corner, you know, evade some tacklers, and then when everyone else goes out of bounds, he just has these afterburners and he just jets the final 25 yards for a touchdown. He's unbelievable. Anyway, he led the way for the Seahawks in the 37-27 romp of the Niners at the clink mark. San Francisco had some did some cosmetic work here to make it look better, but this game is all Seahawks. Yeah, and it's 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 tough when you're covering like games with DK Metcalf because he does something and you're like 
how can I continue to describe what this player is doing in a tweet um, to do him justice? I, I am so impressed with he has he had his sixth and seventh touchdowns touchdowns of the season, and the second one was this incredible uh, show of fire and might where he ripped the ball away from uh, in a one-on-one matchup with Emmanuel Mosley. And he's just str- he's just like a physical being um, that is going to kill people in matchups. You just can't deal <laughs> with him. And he speed- the first touchdown was this incredible dance down the sideline, which we, we listened to um, at the top of this segment. I think he's a fascinating player. And it's like whether it's him or Tyler Lockett week to week, um, you can't really double. You can't spend all day long doubling either one of them because the other will fry you. And so it's a pick your poison. And I, I think that probably the Seahawks listen to um, people like me that um, if they're – I'm not claiming that they're listening to me, but uh, statements. No, they are. They you know, respect yeah, you. Probably they have it hardwired into their complex. But, you know, saying that, you know, j- that uh, Kyle Shanahan – is going to do a better job than any coach in the league around injuries and um, my whole Kyle Hant Shanahan thing. But the bow. <laughs> no, this bro- whole Mark, don't don't put it on yourself. This whole podcast was drinking oh, yeah. the Niners Kool Aid on Thursday afternoon when we recorded our preview Absolutely. show, and the Seahawks made a little bit of a statement. Yeah, I think they did, and and it's it was an anti um, Shanahan game because there's just two they're too banged up on, on some level, and it's they're not the only team in that situation, but. It just uh, this was the game where they ran for 2.4 yards per carry, 52 mm. yards. Jimmy G, who uh, you know, and there's there there is going to be a lot of Nick Mullins versus uh, Jimmy G. We're back in that world because of what I don't take that seriously at the end of the game. But Nick Mullins just sort of does seem to see the field a little bit better. And Jimmy G threw a terrible interception on a on an attempted pass to George Kittle in this that caused things to get um, out of hand early on. And I feel like they just have to play around him and, co- and organize the offense in a way where he's given such safe throws. And it's just not the Jimmy G that I know from before. And the other thing that, and you know, we, we all like Fred Warner. And I think, Greg, it was you saying that this might be the game where Bobby Wagner maybe takes a, you know, just a little bit of a step down. Bobby Wagner was a picture of utter dominance. I, he he was, was listening. Yeah, I think he was. I mean, he was just all the Seahawks pieces that we trust – came came today and they totally they shined as a group um the defense too i think they kind of said look at we can we can handle our business i mean this was it, it not this did not go the way that i expected on any level mm. seattle yeah, finally Seahawks. had a big game on defense that the, they've been waiting all and again the, what happened in the fourth quarter when the game was already well decided might cloud this for some people but this is to me the first game where the defense played an active role in them winning so this is and you have jamal adams actually returned to practice this week so that's a big guy that uh, could be re-ent- re-entering the picture carlos dunlop's in the fold now like there i think this is a highly encouraging win uh for seattle right there's that um kevin clark tweet that always gets retweeted that the seahawks never play a normal game. this was a normal game they went out there and yeah. they they took care of business and they put one on them and yeah, a lot of Seahawks fans. I, I I did not watch this game, but a lot of Seahawks fans in my mentions uh, bringing up that whole Wagner uh, Warner thing. Uh, Warner's not giving up that. Uh, Wagner's not giving up that belt. I mean, there's no argument to me that Warner's been the best middle linebacker in the league the first seven weeks of the season. Um, but uh, Wagner's line today. I think he's got four QB hits, like three tackles for lost couple seconds. I mean, he he uh, he put one on him, and and that's right, Dan. That them having a defensive type of game, and it reminds me. Division games are just different. You know, it's like I think the Patriots match up well with the Bills and they know the Bills. They know how to beat. Like, that's why that partly even a a beat up Patriots team are in that game. Uh, Division games are different. These teams know each other well. The Steelers, Ravens, like we've seen that. I think it can sometimes um, some matchups just are closer than you would expect. And right now, I think Seattle does. I know they they had their troubles uh, at points last year with San Francisco, but they they know how to handle a Kyle Shanahan offense relatively. And this is a rough um, road ahead for San Francisco because they're four and four. They have to play the Packers on Thursday night. George Kittle was hurt in this game. Obviously, Jimmy G was hurt. Tevin Coleman went out. Um, Fred Warner was banged up at one point, but came back in. I mean, they have 13 players on IR, so it's uh, it's not an easy job. The 49ers are a power rankings nightmare. (laughs) <laughs> it is so hard to figure out where they belong in the NFL landscape because every time you think they've turned a corner, something like this happens, and every time you write them off, they deliver a big performance. Uh, but I think it is, yeah, George Kittle had x-rays on his ankle after the game. It came back negative, but obviously he's hobbled. That's not good. And the Jimmy G thing is terrible. That is 
this uh, he has a high ankle sprain and he's trying to play through it. It might be one of those things where he's not right again until March. And if that's the situation, like this is just going to be an issue that's going to lead to struggles for him and problems for the Niners. Because we, again, we were drinking that Kool-Aid and we were saying that Shanahan is brilliant at the level that it it almost doesn't matter the players. His scheme is so strong. Well, when you take away Jimmy G, though, that that's the quarterback. It's it's bigger than anything. Yep. And it changes things. Yep, and he and, needed to win this game to get to 500 as a head coach. And I, I totally believe in Kyle <laughs> Shanahan, but that his run in San Francisco has injuries have been a big storyline there, and it's you know it, it gets to the point where he can't overcome it. And I and I thought that he would, and he didn't. I think the big takeaway here, though, gentlemen, is that our words can control outcomes in the sure. NFL. Oh That's yeah, that's what I took out of yeah. this. I, I, it's intoxicating. Put, put, put me on the locker room. On you know. <laughs> What is it? What is it? The bulletin board? board? I can't think of. It's, it's like no one even day. still uses bulletin boards, but that's I'd where like you to put that. Put me Halloween in the locker room. Yeah, Where's the I'd Orson like to Wells blame it on my Halloween it. drinking, but I, I have not had a drink in many weeks at this point, sadly. Humble brag. All right, let's move on. <laughs> my body's a temple. Greg Rosenthal. Burrow fakes to Bernard. Throws into the end yeah. zone. Touchdown! Yeah. Tyler Boyd! Sweet. The Bengals score in the red zone and lead it 23 to 7. Red zone touchdowns on third down. Third down touchdowns in the red zone are killer. Oh, show. You know what Charlie Weiss called him? Four point plays. Or was it Mike Lombardi? One of those jokers. <laughs> Dan Horde. What's that? Nothing. Dan Horde. What did, did you really say what I think you said? Dan Horde, Dave Lapham, WCKY with the call. <laughs> Joe Burrow threw for 249 yards, two touchdowns, including that seven yard connection with Tyler Boyd in the fourth quarter of a 31 20 win over the Titans. How about that, Greg? We've talked about how Cincy has been competitive with just about everyone this season. On Sunday, they were dominant against the good, we think they're good, Titans team. Yeah, they, they were so good and offensively. Joe Burrow right now is one of the one of the better QBs in the league, I think, at extending plays and making plays on his own. Uh, it, I see this game as like a two part um, like takeaway in that the Bengals offense really is getting better each and every week. If you if you if you watch them, you see it. T Higgins is so good and he made awesome plays for Burrow. Auden Tate made some awesome plays for Burrow, but he is getting better. The confidence is getting there every week. He said after the game, I heard his post-game interview, just like the game's getting real slow for me right now. Uh I mean, he's feeling himself. Uh, But I also think in a game where he was, you know, dropped back, I think over 35 times, the fact that the Titans hit him twice with no sacks and they, they, there was a fourth down play where he had about 15 seconds back there. They had four new offensive linemen this week, the Bengals, that got hurt last week. And actually, I would say he was protected about as well as he has been in any game. So that's an indictment on the Titans and a, a great credit to Burrow. Well, and Zach Taylor said that the offensive line this week brought great energy to the overall effort, which has just simply not been the case. There were a couple of weeks early on where they looked like the worst line in football and they've been injured and all this stuff. And it's almost just um, been added to the credit to Burrow because there was a play today where I saw him zigzagging in between oh, yeah. like 15 would be tacklers and he still, he escaped it and he, and he got away for positive yardage on a run. And it's like, he sees pressure and he sees behind, you know, you know, in dark spots where other people cannot. And that is just going to make you, you're going to advance as a quarterback at double, triple the speed. You know what this game looked like? It looked like a game between two great offenses. And Tannehill threw a, his worst play of the year in the red zone to start the game, started them off on a bad note. And the Bengals just kept scoring. They had eight drives. They scored uh, 31 points on five of them, on five of the seven drives. And then they put together a five and a half minute drive to end the game, essentially, to end it. They got a little break on a penalty that overturned a pick, but like. They dominated. The, the Titans, on the other end, ran for 217. After the first quarter, the Bengals could not stop Derrick Henry. They averaged 7.5 yards of play. They just didn't make as many big plays on, like, third down and third and long, and there was that one Tannehill pick, and the Bengals never let him back in it because their offense was just too good. The Titans had two QB hits on Burrow. Right. Zero sacks. 
Clowny. Damian Clowney had 40. He played 46 snaps and had one tackle. Beasley. I don't know where he was. They showed him on the sideline at one point. I don't know if he was hurt or what. He was just kind of looking goofy over there. But, man, that those their pass rush is killing them. More killing like Jadavian them. Clown. We don't oh. need the E. <laughs> I do think it's a problem. This, Nailed this, it. This defense. <laughs> moving on past that. This defense is a could be a fatal flaw for them, their their pass rush. They can get a little healthier in the back end. That'll help. But But the pass rush, I'm not sure. I pray I never see him in person. I mean, having seen him in person, I, it was, I don't need that to happen. <laughs> Seems like a bad idea. He'd probably get injured as he was coming to get you. Um, uh, <laughs> offensive Rookie of the Year race. This is going to be the best one since 2012. Andrew Luck versus RG3. Burrow v. Herbert. Who you got right now? Right now I'd give it to Herbert. because He played great today, too, just because he's only played six games and he's, he's just he's been on fire. He's been as good. A, I know they've lost games, but it's, it's pretty close. How about a co-winner? You can you can have them both. Win. Oh, stop it! Get off the fence, Sessler. <laughs> no, I would go Herbert. I mean, but Burrow, I think is could a it's year coming from on. Now, we, he's coming on hard. He's I, coming fast. I think we could say he's the best quarterback in the AFC North a year from now. I wouldn't say that, that timeline. That that journey would not be shocking to me. I mean, I think he's already the second best. Hmm. You know what would happen, Mark Clowney, who would come after you with a full head of steam, and then you do. You know, you're you're a quick guy. You'd make a little move, a little juke, just to buy enough time, and you'd escape, and then you'd be fine. But then everybody would be like, "Oh yeah, but you know, David Clowney, he really does put pressure on. Like, <laughs> right, he, he right. didn't get to Mark. No, but he's, man, does he disrupt? He is a big time sure. disruptor. And anybody that actually watches football and understands knows he did a great job chasing Mark there. Yeah, he affected Mark's planning and game planning. You know, with the with the unseen <laughs> pressure that only true analytics heads uh, notice. This is more disrespectful than you confusing Weiss and Lombardi earlier. <laughs> Let's move on. <laughs> Go! Back. The throw gets hit. It's a fumble. The ball's on Go! the ground. It's Van Ginkle going to the end zone. Nobody's going to catch him. The Dolphins take the lead. What a defensive play by the Dolphins. I mean, let's be honest. If, if, if I'm trying to figure out if it was Charlie Weiss or Mike Lombardi that said it, it was probably Bill Parcells. That, that's <laughs> fair. <laughs> anyway, the debut of uh, Tua Tungavailoa was a big story going into Sunday, but it was Miami's defense and special teams that guided the Dolphins to a comfortable 28-17 win over the mistake-prone Rams. Mark, the Tua show has somewhat obscured the fact here that the Dolphins are playing as well as anyone over their last three games. I think they're playing with incredible confidence, and I think that they really are a team that um, kind of shows you that when your coach is that way, when Brian Flores uh, is going to – he's one of these Patriots offshoots that seem to have learned a Patriots thing, which is winning games in all three phases, and it was the special teams today. I – this Jakeem Grant had an 88-yard punt return, the longest in franchise history that made this thing 21-7, and he had another 45-yard kick return. Their defense caused all sorts of problems, and we can get to we can get to uh, two in a second. But they really, I think, remember Brian Flores, and this was pointed out by by Henry, and it was a good note that Flores uh, beguiled Sean McVay and and, and uh, Foles in the Super Bowl. And it, it looked the same way today. They made life very uncomfortable for Jared Goff. Jared Goff needs to be getting out of the pocket, rollouts, play action, safe open reads. And he was forced to just drop back over and over today. And they punished him. And he looked very uncomfortable. And they climbed back into this later on. And, you know, it, it, the score doesn't look as awful as it was. But they caused big mistakes from the Rams. And the kind of stuff that we've sort of seen happen here and there with Goff over the last couple of weeks where he's just not right on the same page as people. And the line, maybe, if it's not, um, you know, pristinely protecting him, Goff is not looking like the first overall pick. I, I mean, neither did uh, Tua look like that either. I mean, Tua really, I thought, it's, a, it's sort of an incomplete grade because I think they wanted to set him up with first read throws and run the ball, but they ran the ball terribly. There was a crazy stat in this. There are the total plays run, and I got to just check my sheet here. The Rams had 92 plays. The Dolphins had 48. The Rams had 471 (laughs) yards. The Dolphins didn't cross 100 yards of offense until like six minutes to go. 
in the fourth quarter. The Rams, the, the Dolphins didn't have more, more than one drive over 15 yards. So the offense has a long way to go. And they wanted to give Tua these sort of first read, quick strikes, but it never really got together. And, you know, it, it, it's not like he played terribly. He just didn't really, wasn't a factor. And it was, it was not an impressive debut. I'd like to see, I'd be concerned about that offense and that whole team with Tua if he plays like this. If they don't mm. get all these special plays from their defense and special teams, this would have been a Rams win otherwise and pretty convincingly. Well, it's, it seems like a bit of a fluky game. It was. Um, you know, you'll you'll almost never see a team outgain another 471 to 145, and, and the team with eight first downs the whole game was way ahead. But that also means that the, the Dolphins, you know, could survive being in a shell because of those big plays somewhat. No matter what, though, it, averaging three yards per play is a disaster for the Dolphins offense. But you're not worried about that if you're a Dolphins fan too much because you're just thinking about how resourceful this team is, how they're winning different types of ways. And that is a reflection of coaching. And that is defense special teams. I mean, that is like the old Patriots playbook sort of. You don't know which way you're going to win. You're going to win all sorts of different ways. and, And smart teams can do that. Yeah, 145 yards for Miami is the third fewest by any team in 2020. So to have a a relatively easy win with that level of offensive production, is that's not going to happen often. Also, uh, the opposing team committing four turnovers in the first two quarters, that's not going to usually happen. So, yeah, a weird weird game. Uh, The Rams, man, they're, they're another team. They're not at the level of the Niners, but... Where do you place the Rams when you realize that they whipped up on the NFC East, which is one of the worst collective divisions in modern football history, uh, and have struggled against teams that are more competitive? I mean, that it's it's continues to be a narrative that's uh, formed around them. It's, it's a wait and see because I do think they've had other quarters or, or quarters in a row where you, you look at them with total promise. I love Daryl Henderson. He went out with an injury today. Um, I don't mm. know how serious that is. Jalen Ramsey did not. They, the Dolphins were squelched on offense, and Jalen Ramsey didn't miss the game because of an illness. So that should tell you something. Um, I just think they're mm. maybe one of these teams in the middle yeah. world where you're a wild – because there's seven playoff teams, they could be a, a wild card team. But do I take them that seriously? It's, it's to, me they're right there, to me, what they're right there with the there? 49ers. Sure. The 49ers and the Cardinals. November. Sorry. You got to ask in November 2020 what kind of illness – does Jalen Ramsey have? Well, no, they so they checked. Um, I, I think they went through all the intense protocols to make sure it wasn't Corona, from what I read, and, and it wasn't. Um, but he was not he was not well enough to play. It wasn't it wasn't today. Mm. I like them being safe on that, right? Because you know when guys are getting sick now, they're they're playing it pretty safe, which makes right. a lot it's of like sense. let's not be the Los Angeles Dodgers, let's be the Los Angeles Rams. <laughs> right, that that is true. Poor Justin Turner. All right, let's move on. I thought it was sad for Justin Turner also. Bad job. Here comes a middle blitz. <laughs> Confusing. Fade pattern, near side, Tyree yeah. Kilt catches the ball at the five. Touchdown, Kansas City. Patrick Mahomes was casually dominant on Sunday at Arrowhead, throwing for 416 yards and five touchdowns and a 35-9 shellacking of the zombified New York Jets. You would think that these games hurt me. These games do not hurt me. I feel nothing. I hate that. It's just something I expect every Sunday, the Jets to lose handily, and it happens, and ultimately it's not changing my life one way or the other right now. So I've kind of gone into cruise control, and I'm just waiting for January at this point. Um, As for Kansas City, this always profiled as an ideal get-right game for Mahomes' stat sheet because the last two weeks he's been kind of held at bay, and a lot of that had to do with weather conditions uh, more than anything else. But in this game... It was just too easy for him. I mean, the the idea that sometimes you don't overthink it. It's like if you have the best quarterback in the world and you're against a team uh, that is poor in all areas, just let the quarterback absolutely savage the opponent, and that's how you win that week. Don't don't need to get your running game too involved. Just let Mahomes do his thing. That's what he did. And I think what I'll remember about this game, especially if the the Chiefs' offense starts to take off. Uh, like we're used to, and I imagine that could happen here uh, because all the pieces are in place. Uh, We'll remember this game as Mahomes in the role of Mad Bomber returning. He completed five passes of at least 25 yards to four different receivers. Four of those completions 
resulted in touchdowns, two to Tyreek Hill. So they got that connection going again. And um, I know a big storyline and perhaps the only positive for the Jets is that they didn't get humiliated by Le- Le'Veon Bell, uh, who didn't do much at all in this game. Uh, but neither did Clyde Edwards-Alaire. Uh, like I said, this was really all Mahomes, 35 points, five touchdown passes, and uh, obviously never really in doubt. The Jets actually moved the ball a little bit in the first half. Uh, didn't even They didn't punt in the first half. They had three field goals and a, a blocked field goal, but same old story with, uh, with Gase as a head coach. Once the two teams go in the locker room, one team adjusts. And then the Jets get adjusted upon, and they just do nothing for the final two quarters of the game. Yeah, I saw they had, like, what, two two first downs in the second half or something? The Jets? It's, I, a, it's a joke. It's, um, you know, and, and I didn't watch a lot of this, but, Dan, I, I having gone through a 1-31 in 31 streak with the Browns um, a couple years ago, I think it's perfectly acceptable to not – um, apply your passion to a team that's that probably just needs to be broken to be rebuilt. I mean, and they're getting there. And so you have to almost just root for the worst possible um, mm. finish to the season for what it could, for the opportunities it could create. Yeah. We you see know, the same thing every week with the jets. Now there's nothing left to say with them no. on some, I mean, there's stuff to talk about with the chiefs, but it's crazy. Yeah. You know, things are terrible when the opposing quarterback throws for 400 and five touches and you come out of the game as a fan thinking it could have gone worse. That's where <laughs> the Jets are. And um, Sam Darnold is undeniably regressing, uh, and he injured his shoulder again in this game. We'll see how he wakes up tomorrow. Mm. Um, so just everything going wrong. The Chiefs take care of business, and they will have more competitive games in the future. But Seven the and Jets... one. Looking good for that. I know the Steelers are undefeated, but if you look at the Chiefs' schedule, you know they have a, a two-game stretch in a couple weeks at Raiders, at Bucks. Um, but other than that, it looks pretty manageable. And th- so that's going to, you know, they would still be my pick to get the one seed right now. And remember, the Chiefs. remember, there is only one team that gets a bye, effective the 2020 season. So getting the number one seed means everything in terms of setting yourself up for the playoffs. Let's now welcome in the yoked, the eternally yoked <laughs> Nick Shook. There he uh, is. The body, they call him. Uh, they call him the, the enforcer the protector and still not technically in a, uh, a union with his living girlfriend. And we're going to continue to track that as the season goes along. You're, you're just roommates right now. There's no, there's nothing holding you together beyond rent. Um, and maybe that should change at some point. Uh, but beautiful background <laughs> shook. I see downtown Cleveland behind you. How are you? Uh, I'm good. Are there are there laws about that? I, I feel like after you're you're together in a place for a certain amount of time, there's like there's like a, a common law marriage. Common well, law state law. state by state. Oh, sounds is that like what you're, you're going you're for here, to, Nick? Yeah, you look sounds like you're looking to find out. You're like, I mean, it's like ten years that. though. <laughs> it's ten years now. It I won't be like, what state state by state? But I mean, it's not like, hey, we were hanging out for five months and now we're like legally married. No, no, no. It's not going to be that long. I, like I said, there's a plan. We're just not at that point of the plan yet. Everything takes time. We're following the playbook, the game plan set. We've done our scouting. We know mm. what's out there, and we're ready to to proceed forward. We're on to two or three years from now. It, it is way. awkward though. When you do, you have to like split, like ask her to split the rent. Like it's split. That just seems strange too. That yeah. I mean, I, I mean, we've been doing this for like two years now, so it's <laughs> it's very. In fact, today is November first, so today is the right. day where you yeah. do that. Yeah. Yeah. You right. better bugger. You better bugger to send you know her half and. <laughs> Hey, 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 that in. Sorry, Nick. <laughs> when I was an aspiring um, sports writer, uh, marginally employed from time to time in the late aughts, uh, I found the good way to handle rent with your living girlfriend. Just have her pay rent. And then there's no... <laughs> yeah, that, that's clear. That's more yeah, clear cut. There's a, client, there's a clear delineation of how that, that's handled. Yeah, all right, Shook. If you can get it, it's good work if you can get it. <laughs> uh, all right, let's get to it, Shook, starting with um, a surprising outcome at Lambeau Field. Cousins with a screen left to Dalvin. Gets the 50, angles right, ambles to the first down, cuts right 35, makes a Packer miss, and is loose! Touchdown! Four touchdowns today for Dalvin Cook. That's a 50-yard run, and Minnesota leads 27-14. 
That is one of the best in the business. Paul Allen, KFAN with the call. Yes, Dalvin Cook, he is an NFL superstar. The Vikings running back went nuts against the Packers, putting up 200, uh, putting up over 200 yards from scrimmage with four touchdowns, including that catch and run score to aid his buddy's uh, his buddy Kirk Cousins' stat line there. 28-22, the win at Lambeau. Shook, Cook really is a special talent. Yeah, very special. And today's game, I think, demonstrated the difference between the Vikings with Dalvin Cook and the Vikings without Dalvin Cook. And it's a good thing that they got him signed before the season, which we knew was going to be kind of a looming issue because obviously he's a massive part of this team's future and their success. I mean, when they didn't have him prior, they had no rushing game to speak of and no offensive momentum to speak of. Everything was on the shoulders of Kirk Cousins. And we saw how that went today. He carries the load, and then when he carries the load, Kirk Cousins looks better. And like you said, he gets his stats inflated by a 50-yard screen pass that effectively won the game for them. I know it kind of came down to a forced fumble in the last play and potentially another Aaron Rodgers Hail Mary, but for the most part, um, it, it was the Dalvin Cook show. It was Dalvin Cook mm. Day. Last week was National Tight Ends Day. Today was Dalvin yeah. Cook Day. <laughs> so, I mean, y- y- there's there are a lot of good running backs in the NFL, but I think Games like today really put Dalvin Cook in that upper tier where you're like, our team depends on this guy being on the team, being available, and utilizing him, uh, all of his talents as much as you can. They did today. I think it's him and Kamara this year. I know Cook's missed a couple games, but this season, I think think those are the two. I mean, it's Mike Zemmer's dream. They they threw 14 passes in this game. That's, That's how you dial it up if you're Mike Zimmer. Cook yeah, is definitely. on pace for 27 uh, touchdowns from scrimmage, which would be the third most in a single season in NFL history. And he's missed games. I mean, he's been this. He's having a historically great season at running back. Yeah. That- and, you know, it, it helps them out, too, because their defense has been pretty bad, especially for a Mike Zimmer defense. It's been bad. They've dealt with a lot of personnel changes. They've got young guys in the back end today. Cam Dantzler went out with kind of a scary injury. He left on a, on a backboard and, and on a stretcher. Mm-hmm. Um, but they've got they had him and they have Jeff Gladney, both very young guys. And Jeff Gladney got played a couple of times by Devontae Adams for touchdowns. So being able to control possession and really rely on Dalvin Cook gives you a better chance to win games because the strength of their team, unlike past years, is not the defense. I mean, it leaves me, you know, we I looked at the Bucks packers game as not an aberration, but you just ran into a legit awesome defense and Green Bay bounced back last week and they have 19 guys on the injury report. They're not themselves. I mean, they're, they're, they're banged up. I think they miss Aaron Jones a little bit. Uh, but that hit that Aaron Rodgers took at the end was a reminder of how glad I am that I don't play sports right now at all because it's just like I don't want my body feeling what he probably was feeling as he mm. was bent into two pieces. <laughs> Wait, he, was, his body separated? Well, I mean, it <laughs> looked like it did. I mean, oh. the, still the skin was around. Mark, you're a journalist. You can't you – get, that, that's – Fake news, as they say. There, there was a super slow mo as he got hit, and the ball came out where he's got his, he's like got his chest out because he hit from behind. His head's back, and he's got this look of like despair, and it looks like one of those old like Greek sculptures where the right. the, the guy is like, you know, he's got, like one of the arms is in some artsy like mm, right. on a line that kind of thing. Oh. That's basically was Aaron Rodgers in the final play today. And the thing is, is they're right. Like they didn't have Aaron Jones, and it really showed. He tried to carry them to a victory. The Packers have this issue where when they play good teams and i don't even think the vikings are necessarily a good team even though they no. played like one today but when they play teams that are competitive that are expected to be up at that level that we consider the packers to be at they always will and i mean going back to last year when they got Ooh. rolled in the nfc title game they did it against tampa bay two weeks ago and they did it again today and the big issue is is when they have the ball and they they get into a little bit of a rut they can't get themselves out of it until they look up and it's 28 14 mm. and oh my god we got to get going and they woke up too late today and that's why they end up losing by six points it's a beautiful setup for Thursday night. I mean, a rematch of that NFC championship game, usually in a primetime game, it's like you want the teams winning coming in. Not, not this one. I think this is one of the more, the bigger games uh, in the NFC so far this year. That's a good TNF. You know, Jimmy G's a little banged up The Packers. There's doubts two out of three. Like this is a huge, it's a huge game for both teams. Packers Twitter is spoiled. When, when I see them complaining, I tend to roll my eyes a little bit for obvious reasons. They've had, so many wonderful things gifted to them over the past 25 years. Uh, today, a lot of Mike Petten heat out there. People very upset about Petten in the second year uh, as the defensive coordinator there. Third and, year. Uh, third year, sorry. And uh, I guess this game seemed to rile people up again. Packers Petten heat. 
Pet and Heat existed last year too. Going into the off season, there was some concern, or not concern, but there was some people wondering whether, hey, is this guy going to get fired? And you know, you had to get the whole vote of confidence, or no, he's going to stay on our staff and everything else. But I thought we were somewhat close after that NFC title game to Mike Pettin going somewhere and building himself a second cabin like he did after he got fired mm. by the Browns. <laughs> and uh, maybe after games like today, he might not be that far away. He's a run funnel. And that's, again, why Thursday night's intriguing. Like, he he begs the Sell other it, teams Rosenthal. to run. I'm just saying, though, it's playing the team that ran all over. He he like begs the other teams money to comes run. In from the side of the screen handed to Greg, Colleen's <laughs> hand. He begs the other teams to run, and then they do it, and they run all over him, and it drives you crazy because it's it's a little too extreme. All right, let's head to Ford Field. It's picked off by the Colts. Kenny Moore runs it into the end zone for a touchdown. How about that? A pick six for the Colts. Matthew Stafford was trying to go left side of the near flat, and Kenny Moore steps right in front of the pass and cruises down the near sideline for a touchdown. Kenny Moore's pick six was the nail in the coffin by the Colts, who overwhelmed the Lions 41-20 down the road. Phil Rivers had another efficient performance, thrown for 279 yards, three touchdowns. Shook, the Colts seem to be finding themselves a little bit here. A little bit, but you kind of wonder, I mean, the Colts are, mm. I think it's a tale of two teams defensively, because early in the season we thought about, hey, uh, this is a team that statistically is one of the best in the NFL. And then they met the Browns, and they met them without Darius Leonard, and they didn't look like that team on defense. Darius Leonard is the key to them because he was on the field today. He made massive plays. He forced a fumble that led to a touchdown. And then before you knew it, that Kenny Moore pick six took a game that was a four point game or a six point game, excuse me, it was 20 to 14 to a three score game. And it was like that. I mean, that's how quick it was. And that's the impact that he has on that team. And as long as he's healthy, I think they're, you know, they're, they're a formidable team, but you also can't always expect Phillip Rivers to play like he did today. He had 23 of 33 for 262 yards, three touchdowns. He had a pass rating of 123.5. I mean, this is like vintage Rivers stuff from five, mm. seven years ago, not not 2020. This is not the too Phillip straight. Rivers that That's we saw. Too you, straight. Right, That's exactly. too straight, Snooki. And, and, that, and, that, and that coincides with Darius Leonard. I mean, I think it, it really does go back to their defense. Their defense gives them chances. They do capitalize. But if you need your offense to go win, win a game, this offense isn't going to do it. So it hmm. they're very reliant on that guy and on that defense being able to be there and help them win games. They scored touchdowns on five of their last seven drives. It gives me a little bit of hope because to me, I thought this offense looked like it was heading in completely the wrong direction. A great quote by Rivers afterwards, or just a very Philip Rivers-y type quote. He said, you have moments where you go, dad gummit, we should be 7-0. and Well, <laughs> there's reasons you shouldn't be 7-0 and also, but uh, you know, this was a nice move. I, I am a little How down. How we heard that quote from Phil Rivers? Dad no, I, Gummit. It's saying it's like, I can't think of another human being that still says dad gummit, but he, <laughs> he does. Um, Jonathan Taylor and DeAndre Darning. Swift combined for 23 yards off 17 attempts. I was like <laughs> as excited for these two rookie backs as running backs as, as any out, anyone out there and not happening. Jonathan Taylor to me has been underwhelming. A key detail, uh, Mark. Of those 23 yards, 22 were gained by Jonathan Taylor. DeAndre Swift had one yard on <laughs> right. six attempts. <laughs> I was trying to help Swift out there a little bit, but uh, you unmasked it. That's rough. Uh, this this felt like a doomsday day for uh, Patricia to have that sort of defensive game. And Galladay, who to me is kind of the, the their addition of Darius Leonard, is Kenny Galladay on that offense. They are Mega just piece. not the same without Kenny Galladay. And he got hurt. Another quote from uh, Philip Rivers after this game. I guess he just was very quotable. He it. said, "He said I can't tell you how dead it was in there. And <laughs> in terms of the stadium. And you, talking about the crowd, Dan, um, like I, I talked to uh, to Chris, you know, Wes and Keisha's neighbor, J.B. Long, yesterday. So I'm in, you know, we walked around a little. And he was saying how unnerving it is. He's the voice of the Rams. Yeah, thank you for pointing that. And he said how unnerving it is. You have to keep reminding yourself that this is a big deal because it feels sometimes like a high school game. Mm -hmm. And I think I guess that's what Philip Rivers was talking about. That anecdote would have actually been so much better if Greg never qualified who he was, that it was just <laughs> Wes's neighbor talking about football. <laughs> yeah, just like Ned, who was mowing his lawn, and then he had yeah. takes. Uh, Ned had a really hot take about this uh, stadium environment in 2020. It's yeah, we we talked about it on Thursday's show. That was a big spot for the Lions. And what do they do whenever there's a big spot? They, they let their fan base down because if you find a way to win that game at home, the schedule lightens up. And that means they're three and four. So they're still kind of in the mix, obviously, 
And I wouldn't be stunned if um, a month from now they're still on the periphery sure. the playoff race. But at the same time, it's like, man, go, you know, win a third game in a row in your building. Get hot. Actually give your fans something to get excited about. They can't do it because some teams just – don't know how to do these things. Yeah, but you know what, Dan? Here's the thing. In, in sports, and not necessarily the NFL as much as other sports, but it, you, you don't want to languish in that middle area, and they're kind of in the bottom of that middle area. So as, as a football fan, you almost want them to just prove who they are with games like today so that they can accelerate moving on to the next stage and actually working toward being something. Because last year, the excuse for them was, oh, well, Matt Stafford was out for half the year. Mm-hmm. You know, they were really playing good ball before Matt Stafford got hurt. Well, he's not hurt and you're still not playing good football, maybe we should make a change. Well, the yeah. problem is they've yeah. made about a million changes, and that never works either. So it's like <laughs> there's there's not a lot of confidence in uh, what's going to happen. Darkness. All right, which takes us to, thank you, Nick Shook, Sunday Night Football. Oh, Sunday night. Showing blitz, here they come again, and look out, and down he goes. Ball is out again. And the Eagles... On what appears to be a live ball, McLeod is going to take it all the way to the end zone. (laughs) Wow. When Al Michaels retires, whenever that is, that will not be the call that he's remembered by. (laughs) (laughs) But, you know, it was a weird play. Rodney McLeod scooped up a loose ball uh, after after a uh, sack of the great Ben Danucci. He ran it into the end zone. It was essentially the game ceiling score for the Eagles in a 23-9 win over the moribund Dallas Cowboys. Boys, this, we worried that this was going to be a terrible game, and Mark, it was. <laughs> yeah, I mean, it's, it's suddenly we're in that zone where we're watching quarterbacks, um, that we simply didn't even know were human beings, uh, it, you know, a, a month ago. And Ben DiNucci falls into that category. The Nooch! I, I found it kind of deliciously amazing when they, at one point, they were hanging around and they had that one drive where they ran the ball like seven straight times. I think DiNucci has got some, you know, I wouldn't call them wheels, but he can move a little bit. <laughs> um, so I kind of enjoyed that. But then, then it's just he like... He does have legs that work. It's not yeah. sustainable. I mean, it's totally unsustainable. And, and you know, Wentz, I think he was what 0 for 3 on passes of 20 plus air yards two of them for interceptions i mean he was a mess i'm not convinced um of either one of these teams but no one was asking me to be to be convinced of them and i remain unconvinced right but you thought that maybe the eagles or i thought like the end of that giants game you start putting things together the crazy my craziest takeaway here is these teams look pretty even like, their quarterbacks looked pretty even in terms of how they played, and the two teams looked pretty even. Like, they got so lucky. The Eagles averaged 3.8 yards per play tonight. So, so yes, you, you, you turned it over four times, and Carson Wentz, that was a disaster. The only way they could have possibly lost this game was Wentz turning the ball over, and he did it four times four times <laughs> in two uh, quarters but, but like with five minutes left to the game the cowboys were out gaining the eagles and had the ball in the red zone uh with the chance to go ahead it was it was the worst game anyone's had against this cowboys defense by far yeah it's hard to make sense of how poor <laughs> carson wentz played in the first half of this game considering like we've talked about he's shown flashes of snapping out of it and he's had really good stretches the last couple of weeks and the cowboys have been historically bad And they were running the ball well, the Eagles, initially. So it seemed to be well set up for Wentz to carve up up Dallas. But he couldn't do it. I mean, I don't think the quarterback play was at the same level because the Nooch, God bless him, he can't make that throw the Travis sure. Fulgham touchdown. Their numbers end up being the same, which is a pretty bad... But look. Wentz played a terrible game here. I mean, you cannot... You cannot throw two interceptions and lose two fumbles in the first half of a game like that. That just, no. that's, just, that's just sloppy as hell and they're very lucky the eagles to come out of this game with a win because this would have been a a humiliating loss considering that the cowboys are just such a train wreck uh so the eagles should consider themselves lucky that their defense was able to step in what are two things i really liked the greg zerline kick right before the half that looked yeah. like um, like an insane like uh, you know sinker or something as it, it it rocketed through the skies. What was that? Fifty nine yards. 
Uh, I thought Mike McCarthy a couple times was going to completely, um, his head was going to explode on some of the stuff that was happening to him, you know, flipping his hat around and looking like a madman on the sideline. And then they mathematically showed that it really wouldn't be that impossible for an Eagles team to finish 4-11-1 and and host um, a playoff <laughs> game. And I know that's uh, that won't happen. They'll probably get to seven wins or something, but uh, it's not that crazy of an idea with the team that we saw this evening. Right. They, I mean, they're getting healthier, getting Ray, Jalen Rager back. Okay. He, he made a couple plays. Fulgham is a guy. Goddard was out there. Didn't, didn't do much. Maddox was back. Like you would think they would get better, but they haven't shown it. I, I, they are the most, the luckiest and unluckiest team somehow at the exact same time because you know they're unlucky with with these injuries it you know it happens year after year it started during the super bowl year and it keeps happening they're, they're unlucky but they've pulled these games out of their ass they could be zero and eight very easily i mean they really have and their Some schedule's of the, rough right so and the they, cowboys and the fact that they're in the nfc east to me that's lucky too like all of this shouldn't really be so meaningful but they're a likely playoff team now so they're, they're lucky that they've they've somehow skated by and might survive all of this i love uh what uh patrick doherty over at roto world i uh, follow him at roto pat <laughs> yeah. he writes a great fantasy column he writes a lot of great fantasy stuff uh, but something you wrote a couple weeks ago really resonated with me and that it popped in my head again uh, tonight. He said that right now Carson Wentz operates as an even more demented version of Ryan Fitzpatrick, <laughs> which I just like I was jealous when I read it because it was so perfectly stated. Uh, that's where Wentz is in 2020. He's having a really strange season. I don't know where it's, it can go. It could get a lot worse, I feel like. It could get a lot better. Um, but... Eagles fans are are along for the ride, and he's up to 12 interceptions now. Wild. And he leads the league in fumble. This is kind of who he is, at least with the fumbles. He leads the NFL in fumbles since he entered the league. Some of those, so, I mean, the So him the tonight, like, terrible. that's part of the, yeah, that's part of the, the drill. Holding the ball too long, getting his body caught in an awkward position, getting smoked. Like, these are things that rookies, mistakes rookies make, and this guy's played in the league for half a decade. Anyway. We never have to watch that game ever again. Okay, Let's good. not even think about it ever again. Let's bring in Ricky Hollywood, because that's more important. Hey. Ricky, um, amazing development. You know, this has been, quite frankly, <laughs> um, not just in the world, but also for this podcast, because of uh, what Chris is dealing with, uh, with cancer for a second time, and he's battling, and it's an unreal fight that he's up against. And so it was really nice uh, to have some good news, some joy sprinkled into the ATN podcast realm uh, when you did your Beyonce-like surprise uh, album drop, uh, the great <laughs> uh, story article that came out on NFL.com where you spoke about kind of the journey you've made um, as a gay woman and kind of now it's out there to everybody. We obviously knew this as long as we've known you just about. You did? Uh, but well, not as so. long, not from the first minute. I mean, when you took Pretty us soon. To, when you took us to the nightclub in London called Gay, I was like, OK, I think something's going <laughs> on here. Um, but anyway, we're all so proud of you. And Greg wouldn't go that it. night. Well, I was watching know. the U.S. Open uh, final huh. Osaka, one of the most memorable sporting nights. Maybe of the year. maybe not so open, Greg, when you think about it. Yeah. Uh, but anyway, Erica, <laughs> the floor is yours. We're so proud of you. And it was an awesome read and everybody should check it out. Um, I imagine there was a lot of people that got in touch with you after you dropped. The yeah, audience. it was absolutely insane, like overwhelming. I really didn't expect it to like I figured it would it would be shared and kind of that stuff. But on that that scale that it was and like I like am getting nervous even like talking about it, like it just feels weird. And it was also like I feel really good and, and happy, um, but also like just the exposure and like the messages from people I've been getting from across the league and league offices emailing me like in our NFL database we have each other's emails and stuff and I'm hearing from people that I didn't know existed some that I did and it, it's just a really really flattering is maybe the word humble like I don't even really know because I don't really feel like I did anything that was like this huge thing, but I have like middle school teachers reaching out to me that mm. I haven't heard. Like it's awesome. just, it's just, it, it's been really, really overwhelming, but, 
but beautiful. And I can't thank you guys enough because as you read the article, like you guys have been my backbone since the day that we met. And I really love and cherish you guys. And you're always championing me. And I appreciate it. We love you, Ricky. Thank you, Ricky. I mean, um, it, it is it was so exciting, and um, I think you outed yourself, too, as a good writer. Now you're going to have to, uh, like a really good writer, you're going to have to start doing bylines a little more regularly. I think yeah, on well, that se- secondly, a big thank you to Mark, because I yeah, he saw the first draft, and it came a long way. It didn't, it didn't start off that way. I think that you... Uh, it was great. It was you, great. You tapped into, like, your, your heart and your real feelings. I had an idea, though. I thought that you should make this announcement. It caused such a stir. You should make this announcement like every Friday just to like <laughs> get that, that, that weekend vibe going that because juice. it seems to be quite an event. So uh, it was, it was crazy. Yeah. To, I mean, to get the most of the, this new found writing skill, newly discovered, I should say, uh, maybe a little Eagles, Cowboys, what we learned. Oh, yeah. Yeah. Good. Yeah. That yeah. sounds awesome. You guys, that sounds so much fun. Yeah. Yeah, we're proud of you. Great job, Ricky. Yeah, Absolutely. it's it's. I don't know if brave's the word, but I don't. I I can't imagine you know putting yourself out there and there being obviously knowing that you could get positive, negative. So, well, I good appreciate on you, Ricky. it. There really hasn't been a lot of negative feedback, which I was sort of bracing myself for. Well, that's great um, too. And it's really it's really awesome. A couple of like, oh, so does that mean I don't have a chance? Like tweets and stuff which I guys like, be funnier at least i i laugh but like come on be yeah. funnier exactly what but. about the opening line of the piece and again check it out nfl.com uh and ricky has it posted on her feed and we've all posted it you start with a quote that you um uh, someone said to you in the break room at nfl media which lucky guy are you bringing to the holiday party why do you think mark said that to you because that seems <laughs> like it's a little out of bounds <laughs> Now, hold yeah, on. it was weird. It was. It was weird. You know that um, just just for like the more dim um, sided listeners. I actually did not say that just so that I'm not <laughs> it was not Mark. Yeah, no, it, it was. <laughs> that was a very a, a warm, a warm. Uh, the whole thing is just like a warm hug because everyone we work with, you know, a lot of people reached out to you and um, knowing you as well as. We know you. Um, obviously, this was special to be able to share this with this many people. So good stuff, Ricky. Well, uh, and uh, how about more good news to keep on coming in 2020 to close this thing out? Uh, speaking of closing things out, it's time to close out today's show. We'll be back. And is but speaking of back, is anyone back at your apartment, Erica? No, um, no, 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 no. Good, good, good. But you can Doors see are locked. The, you everything. can see the shades are closed. Smart. <laughs> yeah. Good. So no update on that front. That's also good news. See, the good news is flowing now. Mm-hmm. Um, all right. We'll be back on Tuesday with another week of the Around the NFL podcast as we roll into the second half of the season. This is Dan Hansa signing off for the great Ricky Hollywood, the old boss, and the quiet stormer, of course. Oh, we still don't have his nickname. Nick Shook. Until Tuesday. <laughs>